Good evening, folks. Can you hear me okay? All right, I'm usually pretty good at projecting from the back, but I've been told I need a microphone tonight. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Agency of Education's Listen and Learn Public Engagement Session. I'm Jill Briggs Campbell. I'm the Interim Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Education, also Montpelier resident with two kids in our school system and uh, you know local taxpayer as well. So very, very happy to um, be here with you all. I recognize a lot of faces in the community and really appreciate you taking the time this evening to join us. Um, I'm joined tonight by my colleague uh, Justin Silverstein who is um, going to be facilitating a lot of the conversation and the data presentation. Uh, Justin is from APA, which is a consulting firm that the agency has brought on to help us with data reporting and logistics on the listen and learn. We've been kind of on a two month road show at this point and I do get to brag to my Vermont native husband that I have now officially seen more of the state than he has, which is very cool for me because I am in fact a flatlander from California. So this is big bragging rights. I've seen a lot of towns he's never even heard of. So. All right, um, so we uh, just briefly want to let folks know we're sort of gonna do a, a two-part session. Um, the first part is, is sort of a data share out. I promise it will be more compelling than it sounds. Uh, and that's really just to kind of level set where, what's kind of our current system? What does this look like? And then the second part is gonna be more fun and it's really meant to be a conversation with you all. So I think we have enough folks that will probably put you into two groups and it's really gonna be a back and forth very much a discussion uh, to really help the agency kind of inform our work um, as we all sort of move forward together in somewhat challenging times um, as we envision the future of, of uh, education in Vermont. I did want to give folks a heads up that we have a gentleman from Orca Media here, hi, thank you, uh, who's going to be recording through the data presentation section. Um, so just so folks know if you see the camera, that's what's going on with that. So I think we can jump in. Um, I'm going to do some very brief talking and then I'll hand it over to Justin. So the first thing that we actually wanted to start with is what is the Agency of Education and what is its role? Uh, this is um, actually a question that's come up quite a bit over the past year. And so we do think it's important to sort of point that out. Um, so the agency, first and foremost, we do not make laws. We have separation of government, right? Uh, so we don't make laws and policies, but we do have the task of implementing those state and federal laws. In addition, this is something unique about Vermont, uh, education is the only government service included in the state's constitution and the Agency of, the, of Education is the only statewide entity that has specific responsibility to ensure the delivery of equitable education across Vermont. So that's sort of fundamentally our role. I often joke this idea of high quality, you know, equitable access to high quality educational opportunities is like, I'm gonna have it tattooed somewhere someday because I say that so many times when I talk about what does the agency do. We have many roles. Uh, one of those is that we do take a statewide view of education performance, right? We, the, the kind of statewide assessments, the agency is responsible for ensuring that those statewide assessments happen and putting out the data. We also um, oversee the implementation of state and federal education laws. That's both kind of an oversight and compliance function, but also a support function, because we want to help to ensure that schools know what to do and what their requirements are and be successful in implementing those. We are also the repository for a lot of data. Uh, we collect 400 different data collections from our schools and districts every year. And we are really in the process of trying to use that information. Um, for a very long time, I would say a lot of data came in and then went up to the federal government and we sort of put it in file cabinet and waved goodbye to it. <laughs> but we're really engaged in a process of kind of cracking open the vault, looking at all this information that we have and really trying to uh, give it back to you all, back to our schools, our legislators, our community members, so that as we're sort of moving through some pretty difficult choices and some challenging conversations, that we're grounded in data and in information. So that's a really critical piece of work that the agency is engaged in. We also have the opportunity as a statewide entity 
to be able to identify what's working in the field and to really be able to find those systems and those schools and those educators that are doing really great work and to elevate it and to even try to bring it to scale, right? To uh, be able to um, leverage the state, the agency's kind of role to get these practices out to the whole state. So we have a really unique kind of viewpoint there. And then the last thing I have to mention, because it ends up being a good portion of my job, so I always have to call it out, uh, is that we do manage the two plus billion dollars of state and federal funds that districts receive every year, um, which is you know all the payments, all the reporting, all the oversight. It's a lot of spreadsheets. It's not, not my favorite part of the job. So that is the agency's role. So as we said, we kind of want to set the stage for the evening. Um, we are focused on promoting equity, educational quality, and sustainability. As um, the Education Commission is sort of moving through these big conversations about the future of education in Vermont, as all of these different legislative committees, uh, which the AOE has a position on, so uh, you know, there's a committee on, on a uh, working group on CTEs and the, the future of career and technical education. There's a committee on pre-K. There's a committee on the construction, statewide construction working group. I'm on that one. Uh, so there's a lot of different work happening, and the agency is really trying to center. It's kind of our lodestone for the conversation. How do we create sort of a three-legged stool of sustainable, fiscally sustainable education system that provides high-quality education equitably to every student. So it's equity, right, meaning everyone kind of has that fair shot at the same educational opportunities, high quality education, and then how do we do it in a way that we can all afford? So that's really sort of the, the goal of the agency at this point. So part of that process is that it's really important that we are talking to all of you. We've been talking to education leaders, we've been talking, we just had a a uh, prior conversation with some uh, classroom teachers and special educators and staff. And so now we really want to make sure that we're out in the community and getting your input on what are those like critical priorities when it comes to those questions of quality, equity, and sustainability. So we wanted to ask the question of who all was able to join us here tonight. So if you had a chance to do the Mentimeter, we're being very high tech today. Uh, we see that we have a uh, folks in many different roles. We have some educators here that have joined us. We have some parents. Uh, we do have at least one student in the back there. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you very much. You're going to have to speak for the entire student body for us tonight. We have some community members, and we have some other. <laughs> I don't know who define themselves as other. Uh, we also asked you to identify some major topics of interest. So I won't go through all of them, but we do see a focus on academic performance, equitable access for all students, and we'll talk a bit about what do we mean by that. We, I'm going to say that phrase a lot, but as we get into the, the discussion, we'll actually be able to make that a little bit more concrete, right? What are those opportunities that we think every student should have so that they can achieve success? And then also expanding student opportunities was a highlight here. We also had college and career readiness and early education preparedness were some of the key topics you wanted to discuss. All right, we also asked you a question about your level of engagement with your local school or school district. So two of you said none, right? I don't, I don't really do that, I don't have time, I don't see that it's necessarily relevant for me. One of you said low, four said medium, and two said high, high level of engagement. Perfect. Okay. So very briefly, I'll talk about what is the Listen and Learn Tour. And really, it's, it's three phases. We're in phase three. So on the map, you are here. And we really wanted to do this engagement with kind of all levels of the education system, including the public, um, as the agency is working to develop its long-term strategic plan. So this is work that the agency really hasn't been able to do for quite a long time. And it was really important that as we develop this plan so that we can better support schools and better support students and better support communities, that we went out and asked, right? We asked the question, what is most important to you? What are your major priorities? 
And we wanted to make sure that those conversations were grounded in kind of a shared understanding of the current system. So the first thing we did is we cracked open the vault, we pulled out all the data, it was really messy and dusty and didn't necessarily talk to each other, right? 400 data collections, all slightly different. And we did a lot of work on trying to make those data sets talk to each other and we put out the state profile report. And that came out in late August. And then the next phase was that we traveled around the state, this is where I got to know all the towns, uh, and met with education leaders. We met with 250 education leaders in five different regions of the state. Those regions were really um, the superintendent's regional associations, so we sort of allowed the schools to kind of speak for how they organize themselves. And we met with superintendents and principals and business managers and special education directors and facilities directors and curriculum coordinators. And we asked them about four kind of critical topics. So the first was we talked about um, student mental health and well-being. What are the pressures that they're sort of experiencing in schools? Because we've heard um, that there is a lot more kind of student mental health needs since COVID. And we also talked about uh, educator mental health and well-being. The second topic was expanding access to college and career opportunities, right? College and career readiness. What are the barriers? What's working well? What is it that we want for our students when they leave our education system? What do we want them to be prepared for? The third was really looking at um, driving academic outcomes and how can the agency better support some of that work and what we call the accountability framework, right? So how do we know what students are learning and how can we measure it and improve it? And what are the ways that the agency can kind of improve our work in that area? And then the last part of this was actually some budget conversations with school board members and really working through some additional data with them and really asking them, how can we support you in um, building your budget, strategic budgeting, and then also communication with your communities, right? We know these are really challenging conversations. How can we help those conversations? So that was phase one. Uh, uh, sorry, that was phase two. I lost track. We're in phase three. <laughs> you can tell I've been all over the state lately. <laughs> so we're in phase three. And phase three is really that uh, public engagement with all of you and then also um, engaging with classroom educators and, and staff and the folks that we really didn't get a chance to talk to in our, our kind of first round. Um, so we are heading towards the end of the public engagement. And we will be sort of uh, entering a new phase where we're going to be reporting out kind of everything we've listened, we've learned, this is what we've learned, and now we're going to be working on developing that strategic plan. So I will run through these briefly because I've touched on a lot of them already. And I know you want to get to the very exciting data graphs and charts. They're very colorful and pretty. So the first is, our first goal is to align the agency's work to regional and local priorities. As I said, if we're going to be building a strategic plan, we need to be asking the question, what are the important things that we need to be focusing on, right? I think what we experience a lot in Vermont is that we try to do a lot of things, and when you're trying to do a lot of things, you can't do a lot of things well. So we're really trying to focus on what are those priorities and asking those questions. We want to specifically understand how the agency can better support high quality teaching and learning. We want to help to expand access to those high quality educational opportunities and identify key strategies for improving student achievement. One of our key ways that we're doing this right now is the rollout of Read Vermont, which is a major statewide literacy initiative that we're helping to support uh, districts and teachers in becoming really effective uh, educators when it comes to literacy instruction. And then the fifth part of this is to develop that strategic plan. So working on that strategic plan, identifying what our goals are, going back out to our partners in the field and saying, this is what we've heard, this is the work that we're gonna do, is this the right work, getting that feedback and really doing very transparent and participatory process. All right. Regional themes. So these are the, some, some of the things we've learned thus far. There is a real desire for stronger and more accessible community partnerships. And I'll actually put this in really plain language. Schools have said what we are experiencing when students are walking in the door with 
kind of needs that we haven't seen before. This is sort of the, the student is bringing into the school what they are experiencing in their families and their communities, right? So we have some real challenges with students having higher needs than ever before, but these need community solutions, right? These are not school um, solutions, but community solutions. We can't do it alone is really the big message there. Uh, they would really like for the state to provide some support to help the public better understand our education funding system, which is a challenge, right? <laughs> And so uh, we have actually brought on another consultant group that's actually working with the APA team. They're called New Solutions. And they're going to be putting out what I call a series of like bite-sized videos on you know, how, how does our ed funding system work? What does it mean for you as a taxpayer? How is voting on a local budget connected to your property taxes? And the answer is it depends because we have a very complicated system. But we're gonna be doing some work to help support that because we understand that our system is very complex and it can be really challenging sometimes for schools and districts to help explain that. So we're gonna be helping with that. There's a need for reliable, transparent, and easy to understand data. So in addition to the profile report, we're generating kind of a supervisory union and supervisory district, our SU and SD level reporting. We have a whole series of topical reports whenever we kind of bumped into an issue that was complicated and needed additional data and more analysis, I would sort of holler like, topical report, and poor Justin would think, oh no, there, there's another one. So we're gonna be working on a mental health report, we're working on a pre-K report, just a whole series of kind of informational reports in really kind of plain language to help folks understand our system. Uh, there's also a need to address student mental health and overall well-being. Uh, a focus on expanding access to college and career learning. And the last one is something that we've heard a lot. Uh, Vermont is a highly localized system. And Justin, who works in every state, will talk a little bit more about this. But uh, sometimes I go down to DC and I work with other states and they go, oh, we're local control. And I just laugh and go, ha, 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 you guys think you're local control. But Vermont is a deeply unique system. And one thing that we've heard sort of over and over again is maybe we need a little less freedom and a little more unity. And we've heard that from schools because what they're saying is when we have to create everything from scratch, we're not able to focus on teaching and supporting kids. So we're identifying where are those areas where the agency can really maybe provide a little bit more strength in its guidance and then where are the areas where we can provide best practices and recommendations. And so we want to figure out what are those strategies, what are those areas that really matter to student success, and we want to really focus on those. All right. Okay, so I've already sort of talked about these. I'm just going to breeze through them. So these are sort of the, the next stages, right? We did the profile report. We're doing the public engagement. We're doing the teacher and educator planning sessions. Then the next phase is really the report out. What did we learn? So we're going to have regional summary report outs. We're going to have report outs of our public engagement sessions. What were the key themes? What were the things that were most important to you all? We're also going to have all of those topical reports, which will keep Justin's team and our new solutions team busy for the next couple of months. Uh, and then we also will be developing those uh, kind of bite-sized informational videos. We're going to have the new solutions team supporting districts in their strategic budget planning. What are ways that they can you know, most effectively make use of staff time? Um, are there cost containment strategies? Are there other considerations that they, they might be thinking about? Um, and then ultimately, the agency will release its strategic plan to support schools across the state. All right, so just a couple of things to bear in mind. Um, when we're talking about education, people tend to have big feelings because it's about kids, and people tend to have big feelings about kids. I have big feelings about my kids most nights. Uh, so we always want to remember that you all came here during your dinner hour from 6 to 8 because you care about education, you care about kids, you care about your community, and so we're going to really, as we're having these conversations, we're going to assume best intent even when we disagree. We're going to try and keep our kind of conversation really grounded on the information that we have and sort of the data and, and evidence as best we can. And we're going to be sort of respectful of each other's 
you know, even when folks say things that we maybe disagree with. So sort of general rule of community, and I live here, so I have lots of faith in all of you that we'll be able to do this and accomplish this. Um, our conversation this evening is really when we kind of get to the breakout part, we get to chat, is focused on sort of three things. And I promise there's a method to the madness because everybody always wants to jump to budgets. And I say, no, 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 wait. <laughs> so first we're gonna talk about trying to define what does success look like? How do we know when a kid is doing really well at the elementary level, the middle school level, the secondary level, maybe even beyond? So first we're gonna define success. And then we're gonna talk about, okay, we've looked at what success looks like. In order to achieve that, what does every student in Vermont need to have the opportunity to do? What are those experiences that all kids should get to have no matter where they live, no matter where they come from. And then we can talk about budgets. Then we'll talk about, okay, we've defined success. We've talked about what we sort of share as like our core values for students and what we want them to achieve. Now, how do we balance that with the need to be able to sustain it and be affordable? So those are kind of our three themes. And we'll ask you to go with us on those. I promise we know where we're headed. All right. And so with that, I think I get to hand it over to you, Justin. <clears throat> yep. Fantastic. All Perfect. right, thank you so much. Just one more thing here. Um, you might not be able to dive into everything you wanted to dive into tonight, and we recognize that. There is an exit ticket that all of you will be available to everyone, so that if you have a topic, you want to say something that you weren't able to express tonight, or even in a public group you just weren't, didn't want to say with everybody there, There'll be an ex exit ticket and you can go ahead and let AOE know and we'll be collecting all that information and we'll be reading everything that comes back to us just so you guys know that. So data, we're gonna get through data, then we're gonna get through the conversation. So we wanna talk about data in a couple ways. We're gonna start with the who is being served, you know, what are the students that are being served. We're gonna talk about kind of how much and where the dollar is being spent. And then we're gonna dive in kind of at the end of that to the, um, some kind of 15,000, 30,000 foot view of kind of the budget cycle and how kind of budgets and tax rates are, are set and kind of what individuals pay. So we want to start with who's being served. And I think this is a great place to dive into the fact that education systems generally across the country are complex. An education system here in Vermont is both equally, if not, you know, more complex, right? We've worked in every state. Every state thinks their education finance system is the most complex ever. Vermont likely wins that uh, award. <clears throat> um, so even when we talk about kids, we're gonna talk about kids tonight in three ways, and there's more ways than that that you could talk about. So we're gonna start with enrollment. And so when we think of enrollment, we think of where is the student actually sitting when they're being served? And that differs from what we would call uh, average daily membership, which is who are the students at an SU or a SD, so a district, owns um, and has, is, has responsibility for. So they might educate them in their school or they might tuition them out to another school, but they really own their education. And then there's the number of students who are funded. We're gonna be looking at all data from 2022-23 uh, school year and back. And when we do that, we're gonna talk about something called an equalized pupil count. That's gonna change a little bit, just to throw another, another curveball in there, but we're gonna talk about equalized pupils, which is a weighted count of pupils that um, takes into account the needs of individual SUs and SDs that's used in order to set that kind of fund as part of the funding system. So we're going to talk about all three, but we're going to start with where do students sit when they're being served? 96% of all students are in traditional public schools during the day when they're being served. So that's over 80,000 students. About 3% of their students are about 2,000 are being tuitioned, so publicly, public dollars being tuitioned to private academies. Uh, so something like St. John's Berry Academy. So you have students in that SU going to a high school that's an academy. We have around 600 students, or under 1% of students, who are going to what are referred to as therapeutic schools. Those are really special education students who are being tuitioned to an uh, school, independent school setting. And then another about 850 students are going to other independent schools. So that's where they sit. There are also students being tuitioned to schools outside the state, both public and uh, independent settings. 
So what do the SUs, SDs look like and kind of where, where's every, where are the students being served? So when we think about that, 96% of students were being served in schools. They're being served in 287 schools. Those 287 schools live within 118 districts. And those 118 districts live within 51 SUSDs, right? So there are levels of governance. Um, there are actually more, there are 52 SUSDs today. So again, we are at the 22, 23, but there's been some movement and there's been movement over time in number of schools, number of districts, numbers of SUs and SDs. But what also is important to recognize is that the amount of geographic area that these districts uh, cover and then the number of students they cover also varies. So you can go to the very top right of this chart, you're gonna see a large um, SU, it's SU19. Their enrollment is 176 districts, that's why they're in white. So the lower your enrollment, the lighter your color, the darker your enrollment, the darker your color. But it's important to note, and then so then you can go over to kind of the Burlington area, a number of smaller geographic districts, but with much larger student counts, all the way up to again that 4,200, so much more density. It's also important, you know, in different parts of the state, especially the Northeast, this is an enrollment look, so how many students are being served in their schools, but they also have a lot of students in ADM who they're tuitioning out to other settings, right? So a lot of movement, a lot of different complexity there. What about the trends over time in enrollment? So probably not gonna surprise anyone, there is declining enrollment in the state. I think some of the conventional wisdom is that a lot of that declining enrollment came because of the pandemic. And the reality is if you look at that top line, it's a dark green line, and we're looking at total enrollment in public schools, so pre-K through 12, there's been a lot of decline, and a lot of it actually happened before the pandemic. There was definitely a decline during the pandemic, but the majority of that um, change is before, and it's about 14, a little over 14%. When you start to unpack that number though, the number of K-12 students has actually decreased over 20%. And so the students in the K-12 enrollment are going, going down faster than the overall, and that's in part because if you look at the bottom here, this black dotted line, public pre, um, the universal pre-K has really increased the number of students being funded in the pre-K system from public dollars, and so that has helped keep up the total enrollment line. You're gonna see a couple other lines. The red line is independent school enrollment. And so that's both those who are publicly funded and privately funded. Um, it grew right up to and kind of grew up a little bit more even towards the pandemic. It's come down or become stable. Home study students also grew, grew quite a bit right at the pandemic. It's starting to come back down. And then the two other things we have in here are CTE students. They're part of this overall enrollment picture, but we wanted to pull them out so folks know. It's about 5,000 students a year, give or take a couple hundred above or below that. And then adult education students ranges from like 50 to 150 a year, really small number. Where does Vermont kind of uh, fit within some national rankings? And so every time I do a slide, I think I should rewrite the slide and then I don't rewrite the slide, but we can start with Vermont has small schools. Again, it's not a surprise, but if you rank all the states with their average school size from largest to smallest, Vermont's 46th, so pretty small. That also leads to the, the state having the highest number of staff per student in the country and the highest uh, number of teachers per student in the country. And you kind of roll all that up together and you get a state that's fifth highest in per pupil expenditures across the country. So, you know, small schools, higher costs, but on performance, if you take a look at national assessments, and there's one assessment across the country that's given in every state, so it's the only one we really can use to compare. It's the National Assessment of Educational Performance, often referred to as NAEP. What Vermont shows is that doing really well in reading, fifth in eighth grade reading, 11th in uh, fourth grade reading. Much more middle of the pack with math, 21st in eighth grade, 28th in fourth grade. We have some charts that you can see in the statewide report though that show that relative position has been coming down over time in both tests, right? The distance between Vermont and the national average is uh, coming together and it's not because the national average is growing. It's because the Vermont numbers are coming down. And then we wanted to take a look under the hood and especially later as we talk about um, kind of student need and, and kind of what really is success for students. And just recognize that using statewide tests here, so we've switched from national assessments to statewide assessments. And if you look at that and you look at 
either the old testing system, which was 2018-19, or the new testing system that came in in 22-23. And if you look at English language arts or math, what you see in green is the average performance for all students, so proficient or above. In red, you see performance for what we call free reduced price lunch students. It's really uh, students who are eligible for a certain federal program to receive those free meals, but it's an indicator of economic, um, the kind of the economic condition within a district. Um, then you, blue is EL or English language learners, and the yellow is special education. And what you see, regardless of the year, regardless of the test type, those students, especially EL and special education, are performing far below the statewide average. You have really big gaps. It is not unique to Vermont. It's true across the country, but you have really big gaps between these special needs populations and their performance versus the performance of all students. Okay, so what are the dollars we're spending to kind of serve all those kids and get those levels of performance? We're taking a look at a four-year window here. We're doing, we're switching our kid count now. So we're, we're switching that denominator and we're going with ADM. So that's the average daily membership in a single year count. So that's the students that a SU or SD are responsible for. So it's all the dollars they pay, um, both serving them in-house or tuitioning them out so that what they're responsible for, for those kids. And what you'll see is about a $5,000 per ADM uh, growth over those four years. But some of the things that really stick out to me is that when you look at the state and local percentage of that total funding, which is the big bar in green, it's actually shrunk over that time. And that's not really surprising to those of us who are kind of following school finance. It's because there were a lot of federal dollars that came in during the pandemic. And so it's the elementary and secondary emergency relief funding. Thank you. Um, and so what you'll see is the percentage of total funding from the feds has actually more than doubled. So of that $5,000 increase, about 1,300 of that, or a little bit more, is an increase in federal funding. We'll likely see that start to go down. But is what, what is also still true is that green bar is bigger in FY23 than it was in FY20. So state and local funding is growing, it's just not growing quite as much as the total pot in these years. Again, this is FY23 back, we don't have the fiscal year 24 data yet. What does this look like by different size districts? And so we broke up districts to under 1,000, 1,000 to 1,400, 1,400 to 2,000, above 2,000. Smallest districts in the state spend the most per ADM. It goes down a little bit and then it really flattens out. <clears throat> there are two kind of outlier data points in the smallest districts, just we want to make you aware. If we pulled those out, the shape of the, the comparison looks the same, but the spending would come down a bit uh, for those smallest districts. But the thing that really stood out to us is that we know economies of scale, being a small economies of scale, increases the cost for a district. That just is true in kind of school finance everywhere. But what's also true in Vermont is that those smaller SUSDs have a higher percentage of those high needs populations that we saw back on that performance graph. So they have more special education students, they have more free, free reduced price lunch students. So we would expect them to have more resources or need more resources. Um, so that could be part of the story of them having more dollars per student. Okay. Stepping back from kind of the data side, we want to talk about kind of process and then thinking overall again at that 15 or 30,000 foot level on kind of the budget process and how tax rates are set and kind of how that works within the statewide system. And so the first thing we want to talk about is you know, what's the education funding timeline? And you're going to see an arrow up on that kind of middle left. I think the really key thing to think about, and if you're a district administrator, you know this, like the budgeting cycle, and this is probably true for legislators too, it doesn't end. Right, so districts are generally landing last year's budget as they're working through this year's budget, as they're planning for next year's budget, right? There's a lot of things going on over time. But within one year, if we start at the top, we have the tax commissioner projecting the tax rates for the year. School boards are at, kind of right after that developing their budgets. So what do they think they'll need? They're setting those budgets, they're putting them out to voters to vote on the budgets. As all of those dollars come together, the, legisl the legislature has to set the homestead yields and the non-homestead tax rates to balance that overall set of funding, that education uh, fund. Once that's set, towns send out their tax bills to property owners. 
And then once the dollars are being generated, districts receive three payments in uh, September, December, and April. And kind of coming around back to the fall, they're thinking about that next school year spending again, right? What are they going to need for their students, right? So kind of a constant cycle. So on the next slide, we're going to get, uh, we start to think about um, what are the impacts of Vermont's uh, uh, system which pools funding at the state level in order to fund education for all students. Um, and really this question that's come up a couple of times, which is how can higher spending in some districts lead to higher statewide tax rates uh, to cover the total statewide cost of education? Or said in a different way, how can an individual in a district who either has a stable um, total budget in their district or even a declining budget still see a higher tax rate? So again, kind of 15,000 foot level talking about this, but there's three ways that we kind of think about that could happen. And the first one is this example we have on the screen. And so let's assume you're sitting in District 2. Your district has a stable budget. And there are three, two other districts in the state, District 1, who's increasing their budget, and District 2, who's decreasing the budget a little bit. Well, as the dollars are pooled, in total, you still have a state total education fund that's going up. And so there is a, you know, a calculation that happens. And depending on kind of where things lie, you could still even being in a stable budget system, see as an increase in your tax rate in order to pay for that larger overall budget. So that's one kind of piece that can happen. The second is that your individual property value could go up. And so I say this a lot, I live in Colorado, I've lived in Colorado all my life. Every two years, we do a reassessment of all property values in the state. So everybody's property values get reassessed at the exact same time. It's done in a, you know, a codified way. Well, here in Vermont, not everyone's assessments get done at the same time. So the state is setting a market rate for your property if it's on an off cycle from the assessment, right? So it's trying to make sure that everybody's property, the high level, are, is kind of being evaluated equally as far as its value. And so if your property value goes up within that market rate identification, you could see an increase in your property taxes. And the third one is where we get into kind of the way, and I'm going to use words as if I totally know them, that the yield is set. And so when the state puts together that total budget on the right for education, it also is looking at the total number of need students in the state. This is back in that 22, 23 calculation. And so a couple things could happen if you're in that stable budget district. You could have the same total budget, but less kids. And so if you have less kids, you actually look like you were, well, you're spending more per student. And the system actually looks at that amount per student in a relative sense. And so that means that you're spending more and you could have a higher tax, you could have a higher tax rate. Similarly, you could have the stable budget and the same number of kids, but your need could be lower. So you have less economically disadvantaged students or you have less EL students. Again, that denominator is this weighted count of students. And so you actually, again, look like you're spending more per student. So I think, as Joel said, there, there's a complexity to this. And the question of why did my tax rate go up, you know, it depends is kind of the answer. And this is some of the ways that it can depend. And then the last slide in this piece is kind of the equity of bu and budgeting. Uh, you know, how do student need impact budgets? And so going back to that last piece I was talking about, as part of increasing equity in the system, the current system makes adjustments for schools who serve students that cost more to educate. And so again, we've said it, English language learners, economically disadvantaged, it also takes into account the sparsity of districts. And that allows them to spend more without triggering greater tax burden on the local community. So what you don't wanna see in a good system is where you have the most need, you also have to have the highest tax rates to cover it, right? You are balancing out um, the tax burden across the state. And what that really allows for is that those schools who have the higher need can have those larger budgets that they need to serve those higher need populations. A couple more for you. So at the end of all this, we want to kind of put together the, a bunch of these da different data points that we've talked about. And so we're going to map onto this grid here in a minute all the SUSDs in the state. And what you're going to see is circles that denote the size of the district. You're going to see those circles colored, either kind of green through red. If they're green, they're what we'd call lower needs. So they have lower for reduced price lunch. If they're red, they have higher need. 
Um, and then they're going to be placed basically on where they, how much they spend per AD, um, sorry, equalized pupil and then their performance. And so the top left quadrant is kind of like the economist dream. It would be high performing districts who aren't spending a lot per student. The top right would be high performing, high spending. The bottom left is the lower performing districts who are also not, who are lower spending. And the bottom right is the lower performer but high spending. So kind of if you think of the economist, that's the one where they're, they're avoiding the most, right? And so we are doing this on equalized pupils. So we're already taking into account the, some of the need that we see. And so you would expect to see spending be pretty well grouped around the average, which it absolutely is. But the couple things that stood out to us as we put this together is first, every, almost everybody up in that top left, that higher performing, low spending SUs have less student need as measured by FRL. So what you see is they're almost all green and actually most of them are pretty low. Um, those who are down that bottom left, there, there aren't a lot, but those who are further down and then that bottom left tend to be um, higher student need as measured by the FRL. They still can be have somewhat, lar they're somewhat larger too, and then you can kind of be the spread through, throughout. So generally what we're seeing is to be higher performing and lower spending, you also need to be low need, right? And so you're having some weird relationships between that outcome. Okay. So then the last slide here, some of the work that really trying to be done is thinking through short-term cost containment. So kind of what can be done immediately to contain costs for districts? And then what are some more long-term solutions? So in the short term, the AOE is going to host a series of trainings for education leaders on strategic budgeting and cost-effective practices. It's going to include best practices on cost-effective education and budgeting. And then also really thinking about what are the best ways to communicate what's in a budget? and why that budget is the way it is, right? There's clearly been some hurdles in passing budgets in the state over the past year. So really understanding like the why about budgets and how to best communicate that. Long term, really need to be thinking through and evaluating what would be kind of model statewide budget strategies that doesn't just include telling kind of districts how to do it, but also thinking about where can there be efficiencies in the state? Where can the AOE help with that? Producing those how-to guides for education leaders on select strategies and practices, and to providing any ongoing training and support to school and district leaders. Okay, that was a lot of talking at you, um, but we're going to move to the breakout sessions next, but would love to open up for a couple minutes if there was any questions on the data presentation or anything else that's come up tonight. Let's get started. Well, I was fascinated by your chart with the circles on it. Um, that's new to me. What I didn't see there, um, and I think needs to be a part of that chart, is the income of the community in which those circles reside. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, I noticed one very <laughs> tiny district near the center, near the average, um, you know, is that uh, is low, lower performing, higher spending district that's really, really tiny. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the coloring is, is a proxy for that, right? So the dark red really is high for reduced price lunch, which generally is a high correlation with a lower income community, but it's not perfect by any means, right? I, I come from a, a city that has a high FRL, but also a lot of wealth at the same time, right? It's an interesting mix that you can have in certain communities. So I like that ad, right? That actual kind of median, median income kind of conversation. I think I had another hand here. <clears throat> I, I think I missed the introduction. You folks are invited by the state or hired by the Agency of Education to look at what's going on in Vermont and give us suggestions compared to how other states are doing this or just to take a snapshot of what we're doing? Um, yes. Um, no, so the question was kind of what, what are we hired to do exactly? And, um, there's actually a team that's been hired. So we are with a firm, APA Consulting in Denver. We've worked on school finance systems for over 40 years and we've worked kind of in every state. We have been working for the 
it feels like a, for, for a while now on both CTE issues and educa edu education, uh, educator policy issues, and we also looked at ESSER. And so we, kind of having our background and kind of what's going on right now in Vermont, we're asked to come in and really focus on helping with that baseline data. So part of what you've seen here. And then just with hosting these listen and learn tours and putting together the communications that will go back out. There's another member of our team, New Solutions K-12, folks we actually work with with other projects on school finance from across the country who really are also gonna dig deeper into kind of the what's going on today on the budget side and the expenditure side. And they also have experience working with Vermont um, districts on helping with some of that best practice in both scheduling and um, staffing and uh, budgeting. So they'll be doing more on the ground kind of work individually. So a bunch of folks who are coming in to do a whole host of things. <laughs> so, um, both of these teams are going to be, as, as we all kind of collectively move forward, and, you know, uh, different ideas start to be surfaced, right? This is how we might introduce the cost of payment. This is maybe where we want to head future stage. These lovely teams are going to get to model it for us and say, okay, if we, you know, if we pull this lever, <laughs> what will happen in the field if they're going to be really working with our partners in our districts to So we are going to talk to you about what we're doing, take a couple minute break, get going no later than seven. Um, I was getting permission, perfect, that's perfect. Um, so again, and Jill mentioned this, we're gonna break out into smaller groups. Uh, are we gonna stay here? Yeah. yeah, so we're gonna do one in the top left, and we're gonna do one group in the bottom right, and what we'd basically like is, if you are standing where I get blinded, if you're on this side, we'll go to the top, and if you're on this side, we'll go to the bottom. Um, it will help in, in your future conversations for understanding is every time you use a three-letter something that doesn't add up to a word, if you explain what the three letters stand Absolutely. So the acronym, what would you like? Absolutely. Um, I appreciate that. So <clears throat> again, we will split the room. Um, everyone on this side of the room, if you can go up to the top left, everyone on this right side will come down. My right will go down the bottom. Um, we are going to have a facilitator who will walk you through the protocol. We're going to have a scribe who's going to be taking down what you're saying there on the wall in these three big categories, which is, again, first saying what is student success, second, what are student supports that are needed, and then what are the impacts of Vermont's funding system kind of on those previous two discussions. A couple things, and Jill said it, these a um, couple times I want to say it again. Really want folks to come prepared to actively listen and not actively respond. So really what we're hoping to get is the information from each of you on how you feel, not necessarily coming back over the top of each other, um, but just your kind of um, how you feel about different pieces of this. Presume positive intent of one another, all here to ensure the success of Vermont students, schools, and communities. We will keep trying to move you all along as a facilitator uh, so we can cover all the topics. And as we mentioned before, if you're unable, uncomfortable uh, to say what you like, we will have that exit ticket where you can give us additional information. So we'll take a break, um, again, right until 7. We'll split up into groups, get everything set up, and we'll get going. If you have changed your mind, there's, there's still that option. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, guys. Um, so as we mentioned before, Sabrina will be here taking down information across the three. Um, so our goal here is to explore what it means for our students to achieve educational success and how, that, uh, how we can support the opportunities to help them get there. Um, we've already talked a lot about the other piece, but again, just respecting each other's uh, 
kind of opinions, presuming that positive intent, and we'll just facilitate through. But for the most part, this is an open discussion, right? So we're going to put a question out there, and we'd love for you to talk, build on it a little bit. Um, what we really want to start with, though, is kind of a big question is, how do you know a student is successful? And what does that look like at different levels of education? So like, that likely looks like something different in elementary school versus secondaries, you know, middle and high school versus post-secondary. So when you think of success, like what does that look like um, for students in the state? I have a clarification question. Yeah. I don't know the students in the state. Mm -hmm. I know the students that I can work with. Great. So I can tell you what it looks like when there's student success in front of me, mm -hmm. but I can't tell you what it looks like statewide. So what I see is if I see kids making connections, if they're asking questions, if they're excited to come in and surprised when the bell rings at the end of the day and they say, what, time to go? At least there's a connection because you can't learn unless there's that connection with the student. And you see success when they make the connections and when they ask questions. So that's kind of that day-to-day -day mm -hmm. engagement in school, enjoying the school. Mm -hmm. When a kid walks in after the end of winter break and says, I missed this place, that's a, that's a sign that you're being successful with them and you can't engage them unless they want to be there. So having that excitement is the first step in getting their success. But for others, what does success look like to you? Is it types of courses that they're able to take? Is it um, experiences that they're able to have? So I was filling out this form and it asked uh, differentially between elementary and secondary. So at the elementary level, particularly like around third grade, that students are reading and uh, doing math at grade level. Mm -hmm. um, Experiencing or having a little window into the world beyond the town or, or uh, county they live in. Anything else? Is there anything else that you really think of? Like, okay. um, I'm just thinking like um, students can kind of you can you can see within them that they've got this like idea of uh, what their expectations are every day that they're consistent expectations from not just like their individual teachers but but all systems within the school district or, their, or the school that they're in um, and that you can see within them that they have uh, especially with the older students that they've reached a, a level of knowledge of how to advocate for themselves because there's a there's a a goal of mutual respect between how students are treated um, and, and in turn because us as adults have modeled behavior that would teach students how to be respectful we have been respectful to them. Yeah um, I think mutual respect. Mutual respect, respect and a goal of equity and inclusivity. How do you measure success? So, right, so these are kind of the ways you're thinking about it. Are there key ways that you measure success? So clearly states have grown to use tests to measure success. So that's one way. It's not always, you know, not controversial. Um, but we do that. What are other ways that you think about measuring success? Is it the, again, types of courses they've had? Is it their preparedness for secondary or for post-secondary? Like, when you think of graduation rates, it, dropout yeah. rates. You know, here's what we want them to do. What are some of the ways that you might measure that success? So I'm specifically here as a, a manager of school nutrition for my school district and a member of the School Nutrition Association of Vermont. Um, on the, I'm on the board. And so for me, looking at student success, it clearly correlates to universal school meals um, and the increase in our paid student population that are participating in our school meals on a daily basis because those students have the means as well. Not all of them, um, but we assume that a, 
a portion of those students have the means to receive lunch from home but are choosing to eat what we know is more often than not a more nutritional, uh, well-balanced meal. So when I look at the numbers of students that are participating in our school meal program, I, I know that they're going to be more successful because they're getting a well-balanced, healthy, nutritious meal every day. And that's thanks to Universal School Meals. Otherwise, I think attendance rates. Um, uh, kids who aren't in, not, some of really good points were made about the child's engagement mm -hmm. in, the, in the school. If they're not engaged, they're more likely to be absent. So I would look at attendance rates. And kind of digging into that, like I think we've hit <clears throat> some of the kind of making connections and things like that. Is that across grade levels? And you know that's because that's something we hear like when we get to secondary, right? That it's engagement and keeping kids engaged is such an important part of um, getting them through to graduation and then whatever career might look like. Are there certain ways that you think um, and we can sort of move even in a little bit into the student experience, like things that schools can be doing to keep these students engaged that that really heighten that engagement? They need to have lots of, you need PE, you need enrichment. You can't just have it be come in, sit, go out, come in, sit, go out. You've got to have them engaged in physical activities and music activities and art activities, not just the academics, to get the academic achievement that you need and what you want. If you limit it to just the academic, it shuts them down many times. I would say a couple things. One is creativity. That we need creativity and enthusiasm from adults um, in order to maintain student engagement and um, enhance their experience. And, and, um, and secondly, I, I'm going to echo um, uh, the point about they need to be well fed. They need food. And we're very fortunate in Vermont to have universal school meals so that our students have that incredibly basic need met. I would like to add, too, that I think at every level, and I was a teacher for a long time, the importance of having kids do projects and learn about things they care about that are all their own. And yeah. And independent learning, uh, you know, we used to do something called MILT, which is my independent learning. Mm -hmm. They would just learn about black holes or tractors or, and that could be equally true with senior projects at the mm -hmm. end, a, requ a requirement for graduation. So all the way K-12, opportunities for kids to learn about what they care about. This one might go back a little bit yeah. to the student success, and it's around that question around measuring, now having two kids in college. Mm -hmm. Um, a measurement of what what helped them in high school prepare for college and what was missing yeah. when they got to college or when they got to training or whatever it was yeah. after high school. Where, how did we do? Does anyone go back and measure with so students? Okay. Yes, yeah, okay. so that measurement would be kind of that success in the. And is that <clears throat> when you use total cliche terms? Is that kind of the soft skills pieces? Is that? I would say both. No, I mean, for my just, kids, it was just, technology. Okay. It was study skills. Yeah. It was a whole lot of things. So kind of measuring those skills, both soft skills and non-soft mm -hmm. yes. skills, that are important for career success, be it college, college first, or training or work training. or whatever it is. So yep. I'll add to that that um, Vermont schools often keep track of how many graduates go to college. Mm -hmm. I want the figure that says how many graduate from college mm -hmm. or even stay for four years. I'll settle for mm -hmm. for a data point. Mm -hmm. Right, or having schools. Um, communicate with colleges, with kids in college, and they're under their freshman year. Mm -hmm. What did they wish they knew? Mm -hmm. Did they were they be, were they prepared in writing? Were they prepared in math? What what did they sort of a feedback loop? Otherwise, you have no idea how you prepare them. Yeah. Feedback. Yeah. Yep. Um, in college. Kind of in like college. Yeah. yeah. So feedback. Kind of what, are their, what are their gaps? And I'll add, right. where are the gaps? Where are the gaps? Not, not exactly. only college, but whatever. Mm -hmm. or, 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 or whatever. Training, yeah. Or whatever training. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. I know uh, CTE schools in the state are required to do three-year and a five-year follow-up on students. I don't know that academic schools... Are. I don't think so. And they should be. Yeah. It should be the same thing. Yeah, so I think the note there could be kind of modeling what CTE centers have to do. Without that feedback loop, there's no way of knowing how, you, how we're doing preparing them. 
Sorry. <laughs> to bounce off of that idea, you also can talk to some of the universities or colleges because I know I had a university that took what was remedial writing and four years later it was simply mandatory because so many students were coming in who needed it as rem and they didn't want it called remedial anymore because it was no longer 10% of the population. It was 90% of the population that needed that writing assistance. So, right, so you could get it either from the college or you could get well, you it need the, from the students. Is the great. Students, and then it goes back to the high school. Yeah, and then you, then you can you can figure out what the high school needs to do in terms of technology. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah, but it's but actually yeah. more true about math than it is about reading. The well, colleges are finding kids deficit in math when they arrive. Well, uh, I'm talking my personal experience, which was yeah. it was that one reading class, writing yeah. class, rather right. that was could the be, issue. Could be either one. But yes. I think we're still in the same piece. I think we're pretty good there. Um, what else was student experience? So some of the things that we hear about, right, in Vermont, you know, there's this uniqueness, right? You have a lot of opportunities for students, um, be it outdoor ed and, and you know, other things in the community. Are there kind of individual signs of um, kind of school supports or school programs that you think really make Vermont schools successful, unique, you know, kind of this, what? for lack of a better term, kind of special sauce that might be happening in different schools? One of the things, I used to be a, 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 a home ec teacher. <laughs> but we Thank don't you. call it that. Oh, man. <laughs> but we, girls we, did it, right? but we eliminated boys it. Should. They don't have it. They took out basic living skills, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's not taught anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so is that, and that's kind of a, is it a broad range of things? I still make, by the way, an excellent omelet from my um, seventh grade home at I class. meet <laughs> kids in, yeah. in the supermarket, and they tell me that they learned how to scramble eggs in my class. Mm -hmm. Their parents never taught them. And is that, does that range from kind of those you know, the whole Mac, the sewing, those sort of things, but all the way down to like financial literacy. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. kind of the life skills. Financial literacy yeah. life skills. has been moved to the math part of right. it. And schools, it's now, in, I don't know if it's a statewide thing, but it is a requirement in certain schools that a kid takes a financial literacy. But uh, they're still talking about checks which how many of us write checks now? Just I only when you don't have one, you have to, right? It's that one time. Where's Ben? Where's Ben? Yeah, I, I was going to say, unique to Vermont in the student experience, I think, is the community connection that happens in the schools and the opportunities that our students have to go out into their communities from an early age and be involved and partners within the community that want to come in and engage with those students. I think there's some success, or I've seen a lot of success in, with a couple of my kids with technical centers and being able to really focus on uh, a set of skills for a, an extended period of time that was not necessarily academic. Um, I would just add to some of the things that Vermont does really well. Um, I mean, nationally, I think we're considered to be doing a really great job with our farm to school programming. Um, and again, that goes into like our community connections, um, uh, you know, even like farm to plate, stuff like that, like getting our kids engaged with local restaurateurs, uh, local farmers. Um, and I constantly am working with students in those ways and like just getting those awe moments from them, like where their minds are just blown by stuff that they're not learning in any other way. And um, for me, it's all about like creating those really joyful moments. Um, and I think that, you know, food is celebratory and the more that we can engage with them in, in those types of ways, are, those are the things that get them excited about coming to school every day. Um, I know that happens in many different fields, but I'm just speaking specifically for child nutrition. Yeah, adult learning, <clears throat> student experience, definitely <laughs> apprenticeships. <laughs> you know, having the ch That's students, the yeah. <laughs> so in that regard, I'm really, it, it bothers me the uh, lack of understanding or uh, use in our schools, the difference between equal and equitable. So it was even today in, in speaking, 
you know, everyone should have an equal opportunity. Well, um, you know, so everyone has an equal opportunity to go out for the basketball team, but that doesn't mean that you're meeting the physical needs uh, in an <laughs> equitable way of your student body. Everybody has the opportunity to go to the tech center, um, for example. Um, but there's only so many openings. And so that, that doesn't meet the equitable standard, in my view. If we're going to be equal, is not equitable. So just because every kid has an equal opportunity to do something is nowhere near equitable delivery of services. And so I heard in the CTE lens that, I think I heard, I should always say that, but, uh, that you know, if there's 100 slots and 120 kids who want to go, you know, that becomes an, a, an opportunity problem, right? Get rid of the front word, right? It's just an opportunity problem, right? There aren't enough spots for all students to kind of get that same opportunity. So that's one way, right? I kind well, of felt I like you were- When I was teaching in yeah. the tech center, uh, uh, we heard from the, the staff that a certain sending school had 20 slots budgeted. You have to budget ahead of time. Yep. So at, at whatever, mm -hmm. 20,000 bucks per kid, you, yeah. you have 200,000, that's, mm -hmm. that's 10 spots, kids yeah. or whatever. So you have 10 spots. Mm -hmm. So the principal says to the uh, guidance staff, you find the 10 kids we want to get out of this building and you, and you guide them to the tech center. And that happens in this state. And that, that is just, that's wrong. And so I'm going to turn that kind of idea of opportunity a little bit around here. And so when we think about kind of declining enrollments in smaller settings and even up here, that, that concept of having you know, schools be a tight connection with their community, there is this question in education sometimes of like, what's a minimum educational set of opportunities any student should have? So right, is there, at some point, are the resource, it's not even the resource, could you get to a setting where students aren't receiving a, a kind of a broad enough, a deep enough education where you start to ask the question of, should that setting, you know, is that the best for the kids? So, you know, the most obvious answer, you know, really small, let's say elementary school where you can't do the art and the PE and the music, maybe you could do art, right? Do you think there's a minimum kind of opportunity level that students either at the elementary or even secondary should kind of be presumed to have? And that, you know, is that something you think the state should set? Um, and so as one filter and lens into kind of when are students being treated kind of appropriately? In physical education, I can tell you that. I'm still a phys ed teacher. <laughs> we still have phys ed. Uh, the state has now required in elementary school, they have it two days a week. Mm -hmm. In high school, they have to have it two, uh, two semesters, two. Uh, that, it, it can be creative. Uh, it's no longer that they have to be in a phys ed class. Health takes it, uh, there's... So the state kind of has that minimum standard. On certain things. But right, when you kind of have a resource deficit, you can start to peel apart different resources. And, and so I saw some, some agreement here. Do you think, like, what are the type of things that you think if a school couldn't deliver, that's when you start to hit some of this minimum opportunity issue? I, it's, I think a lot of the opportunities in career and tech ed programs what they called vocational schools in the olden days. A lot of those opportunities could be distributed down to th third, fourth, fifth, sixth graders. It's an unfair thing that they have to wait until what grade? 11th. 11th grade. A lot of these kids want to start making stuff with their hands, and they're causing disruptions in the class because they want to make stuff with their hands, and they have to wait till 11th grade. To do well, you used to have shop. They don't have. They shop don't have anymore. shop, and they they're not only boys, but they just they do yeah. want to be doing things with. Their their hands and they can't access that until much later. The other I mean, problem in Vermont is class size. So when you talk about the minimum, if you are in a class of two kids, um, it's really hard to teach group interaction. Yeah. Yes. So with your question goes, what's the minimum class size that class size should be? So I think the state needs to Clearly, communities are unwilling to close their small schools. 
mean, there's just there have been examples of that across the state, and it's very emotional. And yeah. and the vote, you know, they they refuse to call. Mm -hmm. So I think the state has to set set a hard cap. If, if, if you can't at the elementary school level, you got to have ten kids per per grade level, but, or your your or your school will be closed. But I hear you though. Is, but is that map to a, a set of like to me? is one way to think about it, is that you map to an opportunity, right? So this is the educational program minimum you think a student should receive. You can kind of map that, if that makes sense. You could say it takes this number of staff with this number of kids to get to that opportunity level. And is that, you know, so taking it more from the what re kids receive versus just maybe the kind of budget side or the, the number or of kids. Or is it that we're saying mm -hmm. that the experience of being in a classroom with only one other kid is mm -hmm. not the ex educational experience students should have? Right. Like, is that the impact that we're talking about, or is it money thing? So I think what I'm saying, so Sorry. if we take it to like a, let's say a high school level, right? If you can only have one section of math in ninth grade and one in one in 10th and one, you know, it's kind of a robustness question at some level, right? Do you, do you think you should have at least PE and, right? Would that be a minimum? Should you have, like, well, so, What I'm saying is mm -hmm. not, it's not even one section of, it's do you hold a yeah. high school class with four kids in it? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and yeah. his and point we is we're closing, we're keeping little schools open mm -hmm. because nobody, because it's a very heartfelt thing. But I think thing. the question is if we set some standards mm -hmm. around this is the bare minimum, then that would force the issue. Right. Right, 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 Instead right, right. of saying right. there's a numbers issue, it would become the quality of education issue, and then you can't you can't provide those things unless you have 20 X students, students who yeah. want to take that class. Yeah. And that's to me that does seem like a better um, strategy. And I would include art, more PE, health education, universal school meals, and languages. If it was me. Yeah. And with everything else. Because we used to also have French and Spanish and all our elementary schools. I don't know if that's happening in yes, When my kids are in school, but not where they are now, they're standard. Not. The other yeah. thing that's affected is, is, is the um, uh, teaching, the amount of teachers you could have. If you get yeah. too small, you can't offer all those things mm -hmm. because They're you don't have point enough one FTE, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> I would I would suggest in addition I'm going to come right back here real quick. Of citizenship skills. Yeah. Okay. That, that is uh, global. Also, <coughs> that uh, that perspective is important. So I'm relatively new to Vermont, but I know that the small school where my father taught in California they had a lot of the same issues, like two kids in a grade level. And there used to be one-room schoolhouses, and that's what that district my father taught went to, and he found for elementary, not for the higher stuff, not chemistry and, and those complex things, that it helped all the kids, including with citizenship, because the little kids wanted the big kids to include them, so they behaved better and try, didn't act so babyish. The big kids heard the little kids talking back the way they did, and they didn't like that, so they started moderating how they were speaking to the adults so that the kids, little ones, didn't mimic them. Is that something that has just not, it doesn't exist? Because you're saying people are voting to keep the schools open with two kids in a grade level, and if they have 10 kids and they're all, and, I, and I've taught this myself, just so you know, I've taught in a class where I had second grade through eighth grade, seven kids, and I was able to make it work because of my background and whatnot, but overall, socially, my father said it was the best year of his teaching, and he got all the kids further ahead than any time he worked in that kind of small setting where it was, you, know, you have two kids in second grade. You know. If you were lucky to be able to accommodate, that's a, a teacher training issue. And that's a teacher, oh. and that's a licensing okay. issue, because you have, yeah. now you have, now in those days with a one-room schoolhouse, you had one teacher and they didn't have endorsements, and you've now broken down the licensure process where you'd have to have a PE person and an art person and a librarian, and they all have separate endorsement areas, which makes that well, I have role. four. I have four credentials, so right, but that would be why I'd be here. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, so the scale book. So I was going to say, uh, in addition to the state setting a hard cap on elementary schools, they have to have 10 kids per grade level. Mm -hmm. I would say the state ought to say, we're going to have one high school per county. Now, oh. uh, I recognize that, that uh, 
Hutchinson County is an outlier. And you'll be leading that, correct? <laughs> well, uh, you know, is it politically realistic? Is it something that, that the agency would advocate for? Who knows? But if we're trying to talk about kids' success, delivering opportunities, being able to have art and, and gym and and all the, the wide array, uh, array of advanced courses or chemistry or, you know, if we want to offer those things to kids so they have success when they go to college and we have fewer of those blank spaces when they go to school and say, well, I didn't get this, then if we're really doing a school system for the state, shouldn't we think about, at least ask the question, no, I, I we have one, one high school per county. Yeah, the comprehensive high school concept has come up a lot. That has a tech center associated with it. And that's exactly right. I think that was, and some of that comes up because right now a lot of experiences, and I'm going to say this out loud and I love kind of reflection back, a lot of our experiences are or. So you can go to the CTE center or you could stay and do AP right. courses. Yeah, right. And by having some more of the comprehensive center, you can have more and, right? I can be multiple things and I think Historically, even when I was growing up, right, my high school, the, the, the shop was in the basement, right? You didn't go to, if you were an AP kid, you didn't go to the basement and, and take they never shop. saw one another. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whereas now, I think, I encourage my son who goes to UVM over and over, like, go get a welding certificate your senior year, because you can do that, right? Like, there's this different feel of the end. Um, and so I think that's come up quite a bit of, like, how do you create more opportunity together? Right. Yeah. Geographically, yeah. it's a problem in Vermont because mm -hmm. it's no longer in the basement. It's three towns over yeah. there. And right. so if I choose to go to the tech center, I can't do something else. Which yeah. You can't go back and forth, and the tech kids can't go ahead and take a Shakespeare class, and the well, kids yeah. in AP can't go back and do you know, welding. Kids who are really motivated can. You take the morning courses, you take yep. AP Calc, and then you get in the car and, and you, you go take it. Right. You go take automotive technology right. in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Perfect. But it takes a special kid and special teachers yeah, to be able to, to facilitate yeah. that. Yeah, and, and there's some of the like transportation right. barriers that we yeah. heard for different for different students. Yeah. I think. Yep. And then just like perfect scheduling. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, you got a hand back there, sir. So. Yep, sorry. I was just going to add um, strong foundational readings and math experiences, so focusing, investing on early education, because then there's a trickle down if they don't have those skills beyond. And also educator quality, so really holding our teacher prep programs to higher standards so that educators feel caught, especially elementary, who are required to do so many different things. So they don't, no. they're not teachable at Okay. All right, I'm going to respond to our third bucket really quick. And just, and I think I was supposed to say this before, and I didn't. We're going to have an opportunity at the end, so we'll stop hopefully about a quarter till we have stickies somewhere, little dots. And you can come up here, or I believe even to the other sheets, and you'll be able to kind of put a dot next to things you really agree with and you would want to call out. Um, so next is budget. I know that has not been a topic in the state at all, so this won't take long. Um, I think the first thing I want to just get a baseline for here is like a lot of the conversation is around declining enrollments, like even that conversation you just had about that educational opportunity. Um, and so that a lot of the different districts are facing declining enrollments in their system. Is that something that's happening here regionally? Are you seeing as much declining enrollment? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the impacts that you've seen on your systems with that declining enrollment? Cost more. Cost more. That denominator is going down <laughs> and that cost is not. Yeah. Okay. So it costs more. Good teachers are leaving. Yeah. That's right. And you think they're leaving? Because of the declining enrollment, because there's not enough resource to pay them? Or is it both. both? Yeah. Okay. And retirement. They're required to do more. What's that? It's required to do more. They're required, okay. So they're required to do more within the system. Baby boomers are kind yeah. of, yeah. Right, yeah, retirement. We just have to keep working. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, and so when we think about schools in the state who, who are starting to have that lower um, enrollment, and are struggling to provide those full range of educational opportunities. Um, but we know that those are, you know, it's really important to families. How should Vermont balance the small settings with the need for educational opportunities for all students, right? So in a system that really is interrelated, like do you kind of, where do you think the balance needs to, to be driven um, between that local opportunity and that local kind of control and then the overall kind of need for opportunities for kids in the state? Um, so, I am 
a parent of kids in a small school yeah. and understand you know what some folks have been expressing as far as how does one have those opportunities in a small setting. My kids are in multi-age classrooms mm -hmm. and they've had amazing experiences. They've had a great the school is a welcoming hub of the community. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be an outlier. So kind of to your question is, is I think it needs to be done at not the micro local level, like we manage schools now. Yeah. But I would say the macro local in some way. Because when I hear somebody say we should have one high school in every county, I think, how long is my child going to be on a bus? Mm -hmm. Right? I think, like, what's the travel time? And I'm thinking about all of these amazing opportunities that are suggested that should be part of the experience. I'm also aware the school, aware the school day is only a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's thinking really creatively and on more of a macro local level. What are our after school opportunities? What are the after school opportunities in communities that are close, but not combined maybe at an elementary level? And how can we share resources for AP courses? How, you know, schools are already sharing resources for sports, for example. So how can we enhance on the and work on the merging, not full merging, possibilities on a more macro local level? Okay. And I think that comes to what is the last question, and I'm going to open it up just more generally about kind of the, any budget issues folks want to talk about, which is the balance of kind of independence and then and local control with the advantages of working together. And so Jill talked about it a little bit. So one of the questions becomes kind of like, what would you be willing to give up locally in order to have kind of more opportunity? And what are the things that are kind of like, no, that's a third rail, like we want to we wanna have that. And I'm going to add something to this, which is there's also always that question of, do, you know, can locals make decisions maybe up to a point, which is say, here's this, like, here's how much, I'm, this is not a, at all how Vermont works right now, but in other states, you can say like, here's how much you have for funding. If you can make it work with that amount. You can do whatever you want, kind of locally, right? So you, you put some guardrails on, and then folks have to make choices. So to your point, multi-grade classrooms, that's what my kids did too in a really small school setting in the middle of a city, right? That was the choice that was made. Um, so trying to find that balance, like what are the things we think really make sense to pull up and do together, kind of with across communities, and what are the things that you know, local control is just going to stick with. So, kind of, where are those best opportunities to share resources to start to get some economies of scale, some efficiency? Have less on the upper level, uh, and let the and pay your teachers what they should be deserving. Administrators, why you need all these assistants and all the program directors, and then there's more curriculum program people than there ever was before, and they don't see the kids. And so that's something that's come up in other sessions, like would it make sense in a state this size, right, which is number of kids smaller than a lot of districts in the country, um, to have some of those things, let's say like curriculum, like to have that more um, done at the statewide level, or at least have choices that are vetted at the statewide level, are those the type of things that might help build some efficiency? Because I mean, you know, right now, that's not something the state can really do. If you close a small school in a community, mm -hmm. I've taught in many small schools. Uh, right now, they have 65. I teach in teach. And uh, there's more cars in the parking lot than there. There's only four real teachers. But with all of the other required things that are added onto it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yes, one room schoolhouses were wonderful, but by law, we can't do that anymore. Uh, so, but if you close a school in a community, you close the community. And every, I don't know about here, but Every, I know when my kids went to Berlin Elementary, that's where I met my friends, and they are still my friends. 
and we do everything, a lot of things together. And even the people who have moved out and moved over to Chittenden County, they come back here because this is where they made their friends when their kids were in elementary school. And when you do, when you close an elementary school in a town and they go to another town, that town, they have lost their connection. But are there responsibilities being handled either by that school or their district or their SU that you think well, we could pull speed, could, could we create some efficiencies in some way? So like you talked about, there's a lot of curriculum people in a lot of places, right? Could you pull that up either everything at the SU or maybe even like some support from the a AOE and helping think through different curriculum possibilities? Are there, are there other places you think really are some low hanging fruit to start to share responsibility and get some efficiencies? One of the things that's happened since small schools and one room schools house used to happen is the schools are expected to do more. That's right. Mental health facilities you talked about earlier, those kind of things. And to be honest, a lot of small schools cannot hire people. That's right. Just like phys ed people. One day a week. Right. Or two hours yep. a week for a uh, mental health person. The smaller the school gets, the more difficult it is to offer those experiences. So I think by and large, school districts in the state do a really good job of budgeting and, and providing what they can within the structure that they're given. Mm -hmm. um, we, according to your chart, we're not the highest spending per pupil in the country. We're fifth. Mm -hmm. and, and our results are remarkably good. You know, uh, so um, particularly in early grades. So um, I think school districts by and large are budgeting wisely and spending wisely. We have this, uh, you know, Act, Act 60 that, that did this whole thing of uh, making property wealthy towns balanced with property poor towns in terms of distributing uh, resources across the state. Mm -hmm. You know, unintended consequences are an interesting thing. And where we've come to now is that income wealthy towns, like your chart, right? Mm -hmm. Your big bar chart where yeah. the income wealthy town raised their budget by half a million bucks, and now the smaller town with the stable budget is all of a sudden paying more in taxes mm -hmm. because the wealthy town, and you look, you look, in, uh, in, I'm going to pick on a school district. You look at uh, south of Burlington at the CVU school district, so Shelburne, Charlotte, Hinesburg, um, you know, our members of this school district, just the gyms, they have like four gyms there. You know, they have, they have and so that district is spending a lot of money. They got hit hard by this new student waiting thing that is bringing some equity back to, to spending in the state. Um, so I don't really know where I'm going with this, except to say that I think school districts are doing the best they can mm -hmm. given the circumstances they're finding. Mm -hmm. And if we found a way at the state level to continue to uh, balance the ability to pay for our schools throughout the state, we would continue to see reasonable spending and high performance by our schools. I'll just add to that that almost annually there is some unfunded mandate that comes down that districts have to figure out how to fund without a designated funding source. Mm -hmm. And then that looks like overspending, but it's required spending, mm -hmm. actually. I do think there's an opportunity for economies of scale in pre-K. At the same time that we were forcing mergers of school districts, we were vastly expanding the number of small pre-K programs accessing public dollars. And that's using the kind of hybrid approach to public and private partner partnership. Driven through the LEA, yep. yep.
which continues to benefit kids who get who, who can afford to go right. right and actually creates a wider divide for kids coming into kindergarten in terms of their abilities to read and, and do math with their peers and makes it even harder for our public elementary schools to bring the low performing kids up to standard. That's what our pre-K system has done. Um, just to totally shift topics to some of the stuff that maybe the AOE could kind of look at. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but what I would love to see is more resources for our school boards. Um, I, speak, I'm, I live in Barrie. Yeah. We had a really tough time with the yeah. budget. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think our school board has the, the best interest of our students, but I think, um, you know, there are definitely resources or overarching kind of guidelines, best practices that the AOE could have imparted that would have helped us in some of our decision making. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think. You know, I was on the school board for a short period of time before a job experience came up that kind of made it so that it wasn't appropriate for me to yeah. be on. I worked for the AOE for a little bit, so it didn't make sense anymore. But um, in that time period, I, I was I was surprised at how relatively easy it is to know almost nothing and get on a school board. Um, and, and then all of a sudden, you're making these massive decisions for... Um, for your, you yep. know, 22,000 students yeah. in your school district, um, and so seeking from the AOE at large, like, you know, some some guidelines, some regulations, some you need an X amount of experience. I don't know if that's politically fair or diplomatic, but but at, at a bare minimum training, training, like, training like, like, like bare minimum, you have to have yeah. Roberts Rules training. Mm -hmm. You need yep. to have, you know, um, mitigate, you know, mediation financial. training, mm -hmm. financial training, financial like. Training. Like or, or suggested, like if you're gonna elect a board member community, these are the things you should look for. Or because I think, while I'm, I'm not saying that our board isn't experienced, I, I just think more more from the AOE in that regard would be critical to the success of our school districts. We do have a school boards association, we which do. should be training. Should be their board. job. Right. Should be their job. Yeah. So you know. Right. <laughs> More of those resources, I think, would be greatly appreciated and good for our community and for our students. Anything else? I think we're we about hitting our quarter till. Um, so what we're going to do, and I need to confirm, um, are we going to have them do stickies on both? Yes. Okay. So then I'm going to give you my wrap up. Uh, so that you guys have it, and it's a lot of what you've heard. And as soon as these folks are done, uh, we'll get you stickies, which, thank you. Um, and what you can do is you can come through, they call it a gallery walk, I'm learning so much about facilitation, it's great. Um, you can go and just, you know, put a sticky neck to things that really resonate with you both here or up top, they seem to have written a lot also. Um, and so just uh, kind of reiterating what's gonna come next, um, we are, have two more of these sessions this week, and so teacher session uh, and public session, and that will be one up in Linden, and then one in, and I'm going to say it, Enosburg, did I, Enosburg Falls, all right? Um, and then next week we'll have two virtual, and then we're going to come back in December to do a couple more. But as we wrap these up, we are going to be getting out those um, kind of reports on what we heard, like we mentioned, also some topical papers. Um, on things like school construction and special education, pre-K, things like that. So just really want to thank you for your participa participa participation. We hope it went well. Um, just a reminder, QR code, anything that you didn't get to say today, like we really mean it. Like we know that's not always the easiest thing to, to speak up and say something or you think of it a little later, take that with you, you know, scan it on your way out and you can let us know anything you want. Um, and so you guys feel free to see. Where are we? We're coming. Okay, they're coming to us. So take a break. They're going to put these up, and then you guys feel free to um, come put your stickies up. Thank you, guys. <laughs> That's not good. easy to do. I've spent 20 years trying to do that. I know. Some of them are the same. Look at that. Thank you.